This October the 8th, 2012, marks the 11th year since the Watchtower Society was exposed as having carried on a secret partnership with the United Nations for 10 years. Now, I know that sounds incredible, and of course Jehovah's Witnesses will say, no, that's, that's not true, that's something that apostates made up, opposers of Jehovah's Witnesses made that story up. And that's the official line of the Watchtower. But let me explain a little bit what happened for those who may be unaware. On October the 8th, an article came out in the London Guardian, uh, penned by their religious correspondent, Stephen Bates, and he revealed that the Watchtower had been registered with uh, the Department of Public Information, that's an office within the United Nations. They were registered as an associate NGO. And it's not just something where, you know, you like sign up to go use the library, as many of Jehovah's Witnesses believe, but it was actually a rather involved process. All applying NGOs had to submit an application listing their credentials, giving their uh, accreditation as a, a non-profit organization, and they had to uh, agree to promote the ideals of the United Nations. And the Watchtower signed on to that. Well, on October the 9th or 10th, after this article came out, and uh, thousands, apparently, of Jehovah's Witnesses began inquiring to the branches, to headquarters, to their elders, and so forth, and uh, the Watchtower came out with an official statement uh, Paul Gillies, their uh, spokesman in the London Bethel there, he, he said, and he used that term, he said, opposers have made allegations that we have had secret, a secret partnership, or secret uh, um, ties with the United Nations. And then he said, it was, that's not true, all we did was uh, register so we could use their library. That's all there was to it. Well, that was not true. That was not nearly all that there was to it. For one thing, and I, I did thorough research into this, unfortunately, uh, the United Nations revamped their website and some of the information they had up originally is moved around, some of it's gone, but originally the, uh, the United Nations, they, they were flooded with so, so much correspondence and inquiry from Jehovah's Witnesses that the head of the DPI published a statement for Jehovah's Witnesses saying that the Watchtower agreed to abide by the criteria necessary for all applying NGOs, which required them to disseminate information to their public, uh, informing them about the activities and the agenda and all the wonderful programs of the United Nations. And he, he said it flat out that the Watchtower agreed to do that. Otherwise, they would not have been accepted as an associate level NGO. But at the time, myself, and I'm sure many others, uh, we inquired whether it was true that in order to use the Dag Hammarskjöld Library there in New York, that uh, researchers had to be associated with an officially approved NGO. And the word back from the head librarian of the library was no, it was not necessary. I talked to her on the phone, I emailed another librarian, the same answer from both. No, it was not necessary. Any qualified researcher could gain access to the library. And surely the Watchtower would qualify. They could legitimately do research on some topic or other. Uh, so, but I should note that after 9-11, of 2001, the UN actually did uh, change the requirements. And, and from then on, from the time the Watchtower uh, was exposed, then it was necessary to be associated with the United Nations as an NGO to gain access to their library. They said that was for security reasons. Well, 
But even at that, even if it were necessary to register and to be associated and to agree to this criteria, it wasn't necessary for, for anyone seeking to gain information solely. Because the United Nations, I mean, they're all about disseminating information. And they have depository libraries set up around the world, in the United States, but particularly on university campuses and their libraries. Uh, researchers can go there and gain access to all the boring information. And it turned out there was uh, a repository library on the campus of Columbia University in New York City, uh, just a few miles from Bethel. And Bethel surely knows that. They sent some of their Bethel boys to Columbia to get law degrees so they could, uh, well, I won't go into all that, but so it, even if it had been necessary uh, to register as an NGO, it wasn't necessary <laughs> in order to gain information. And of course, now the United Nations has a massive amount of information online as um, as it, it was the case as well, even in the late 90s. So the Watchtower story is, is a lie. It wasn't necessary for them to register to gain access to the library. And not only that, registering, being associated as an NGO required the Watchtower and any registered NGO to disseminate information on behalf of the United Nations. And every year there was an annual review to make sure that associated NGOs were fulfilling their contractual obligation and they had to submit proof that they were complying with the terms of their application. And as a matter of fact, some NGOs were delisted by the United Nations for not having met the criteria. They were originally accepted and then years into the, the, their partnership, the review process came up and they were delisted. But the Watchtower wasn't delisted. They voluntarily withdrew a couple of days after uh, this article came out in The Guardian. And I might say, uh, it's interesting the timing of all that as well, because if you recall, I know some of you watching this video might be rather young, but 9-11 was a pretty big shock. And the news stories were full of, you know, stories about the families and the 9-11 victims. And if you recall, it was just a month after uh, George Bush went off and uh, sent the American armies into Afghanistan created an invasion. So there was a lot going on in the world. And here this article comes up in The Guardian less than a month after 9-11. And I think the story sort of got lost. Had, had the timing been different, I think other news agencies would have picked up on it and it would have been um, much more widely disseminated among journalists. Uh, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Getting back to the, the, the meeting the criteria, more than 10 years before that, and some of us, I mean, I was a loyal Watchtower reader, you know, that was considered, you know, part of your spirituality. You read every magazine that comes out. And I remember <laughs> late 80s, there were several Awake magazines that published these gushy articles about the United Nations. Whereas previously, as all of Jehovah's Witnesses know, uh, the Watchtower identified, of course, the League of Nations and then the United Nations as the Eighth King and the scarlet-colored wild beast, and it's going to be the disgusting thing that brings desolation. But suddenly, there were, well, not suddenly, but gradually, there was a subtle turning, and there were explaining more about the hopes and aims of the United Nations. And they'd always say, well, this is a man's, you know, scheme. But it was definitely more toned down than the, you know, prophetic rhetoric of the wild beast. And, and some of the articles later on didn't mention anything about the UN and, and prophecy. Well, it was a head scratcher for some of us back then. But now looking back, 
it is obvious that those articles were written specifically, very cleverly written, so that Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't be overly concerned. Although, as I say, some of us were. And I remember having discussions back then with other uh, brothers and sisters. But those articles apparently were submitted to the DPI for their review as they were preparing to submit their application. So the, the DPI required that all associate NGOs use a portion of their assets, uh, capabilities of reaching the public. Use a portion of it, not all, but a portion to inform the public about the United Nations. So the Watchtower apparently thought they could pull this off. Yeah, we'll still do the hard-hitting prophetic stuff, but then we'll use the Awake and write some of these soft, mushy articles. And, and uh, that's exactly uh, what they did. In 2004, I let it go a couple of years. By the way, I, I, I like to mention that when I first got a computer and, and got online with uh, back in the dinosaur days of um, you know dial-up, America online and all that, one of the first things I did, I was researching the United Nations. From, of course, from what I believed as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and how they were going to be used by God. And I began reading books about it. I mentioned this in an article on eWatchman.com. It's an article entitled uh, Me and Lyndon LaRouche. But I started reading like the John Birch Society literature because they really hammer on the UN, get us out of the UN, US, us. Anyway. And that they had mentioned that NGOs were being used by the UN, the globalists, to condition the public to accept the United Nations, to, to allay the uh, patriotic nationalism uh, that is uh, quite strong in, in the United States. So I, I started doing research on these NGOs, and this is probably like 94, 95, like I say, I just got on the internet and I got on, and the UN had a website there and a listing of all their NGOs. And down there at the bottom, in alphabetical order, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And I, I was pretty stunned at the time, but I kept that under my hat, so to speak. Uh, but as, as the years went on, I knew something was definitely wrong at the headquarters. And then when this uh, article broke, I, I immediately recognized it, that it was an apostasy, that there was an apostasy that had occurred within the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses at least 10 years prior. So anyway, in 2004, I, I was overcome by the spirit, I suppose you would say. And, uh, I undertook to contact uh, every kingdom hall in the United States, North America, basically in the English-speaking world. Not every congregation, mind you, because that, that was a little problematic, because I only had a mailing list for every kingdom hall. And of course, some kingdom halls have two and three and some four congregations that meet there. But anyway, I, I had purchased uh, an up-to-date mailing list and there was no way that I could, you know, stuff, well, it was over 6,000 kingdom halls just in the United States. So I, I hired a private company, and it, I think I ended up paying five or 6,000 bucks, but the spirit was still going. So I, I, I went ahead and did Canada and Australia and England and all the branches by my, you know, licking and stuff. I've used a couple of printers up because I've done other uh, <laughs> mail out since then. But, but I wrote a, an eight page letter, uh, four pieces of paper front and back. And my intention was to notify the elders and set this straight because they had heard this, you know, we did it for the library card and a post, and that was a lie. And, you know, I was righteously indignant and felt, you know, these, these Men have to be exposed, you know, that's... 
So um, that's, <laughs> I handed a copy of the letter to my own elders. And of course, that started my um, disfellowshipping proceeding. But the wheels grinded kind of slow on that, actually, and it took a while to get back from Bethel and all of that. And in the meantime, I, uh, I started working on a book. And the book was basically just a compilation of articles that I had been writing on eWatchman.com. And my friend Timothy, he was a writer, actually, before we met. He, he wrote like science fiction stuff, so he was a really bona fide writer. I never considered myself a writer, I, and I still don't, really. But I had something to say, and so, you know, I've been pecking away, and things just accumulate. But Timothy said, well, why don't you write a book? And so I, I wouldn't know how. He said, well, okay. there's self-publishing. You can do that. So that's what I did. And by the time my appeal hearing came around, I told him, well, look, I'm just sending a book to the publisher and you know, I'm, I'm going to expose this more. And so anyway, I was disfellowship. That was in um, the spring of 2005. But in the book, if you're not acquainted with the facts of, of this situation, there's a chapter in the book that I, I go into quite a bit of detail. It's called Strange Bedfellows. And I list all the instances where the Watchtower has promoted the United Nations through various articles. And on, on the eWatchman.com, there is a, a, a PDF addendum to that and I list hundreds and hundreds of mentions of the United Nations and uh, the Awake magazine mostly. They use the Awake much more than the Watchtower to do that. And the thing is, you know, it's on the cover of the, you know, the Watchtower and Awake said that this this magazine is completely neutral, it doesn't it's nonpartisan, it doesn't get involved in politics. But that's just simply not true. How can you promote the UN and, and go to such lengths to inform the public about the UN and yet completely ignore other agencies that supposedly, you know, do good things? And, and I mentioned that and give an example in, in uh, Strange Bedfellows, for example, the, the Peace Corps, which Kennedy instituted in the United States in the early 60s, and it trained thousands of young people that sent them out to the third world to help with all kinds of things, did all sorts of good. The Watchtower has never, ever mentioned, for example, the, the American Peace Corps. And other uh, agencies do good things. You know, every year the, 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 the UN comes up with, it's the International Year of, you know, save the whatever, the International Year of the Children, the International Year for Human Rights. And you will find every year the Watchtower announced the International Year of whatever it was. That was their obligation as a partner with the DPI why didn't they announce, you know, the 200th anniversary of the, you know, the, uh, the United States or whatever, you know. They did celebrate the 50th anniversary of the signing of the United Nations Human Rights Document. And they wrote a big article on that. I think that was in 98, November 1st or, 5th, or 22nd, uh, 98 Awake, I believe. I mean, it was half the magazine was devoted to that. And one magazine was listed on the United Nations website as an example of what a supporting NGO is supposed to do. So basically, they, they lured Jehovah's Witnesses into an act of apostasy. Because as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you are dedicated to announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. That's what it says on the cover of the Watchtower, right? Announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. There's no compromise. There's no, well, using a portion of our assets to inform the public about all the good things the United Nations does. But these wicked men in Bethel did that very thing, which meant that all of Jehovah's Witnesses who were publishers and pioneers at the time were carrying this literature to the public that had been written 
intentionally promoting subtly, cunningly, the interests of the United Nations. Is there community responsibility in that? <laughs> Listen, what, what the Watchtower did is apostasy by their own standards. And I make that clear in uh, Strange Bedfellows as well. They lambaste, you know, the, the Christendom for their support for the League of Nations and the United Nations. And they, you know, they use the scriptures to show that Christendom is a prostitute. She's a spiritual prostitute. But what does that make the Watchtower? And that's incidentally why, not coincidentally, why I chose that title, Strange Bedfellows. Because it is, according to the Watchtower's own standards, an act of treachery, betrayal of Jehovah, and apostasy. Well, the significance of that, that, that sort of helps us place ourselves in relation to Jehovah's judgments. I recognize that one of the first articles I had written in 2002 was King of the North. And one of the things the King of the North does, he seduces by smooth words those who are acting wickedly against the covenant, he seduces them into apostasy. Oh, the Watchtower says, well, yeah, that was, that was Christendom way long time ago. <laughs> and then they became more apostate, you know, and they colluded with Hitler. You know? So that would have to mean that the clergy were actually in a covenant with Jehovah, in the new covenant, that they were anointed. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses have it in their minds. Well, God would never allow, he would never allow his organization to go apostate. Well, has he ever had an organization that didn't go apostate? <laughs> Israel and Judah, I mean, that was a constant, constant thing. When Jesus was on the earth, one of his apostles was the son of destruction. He was sitting with Jesus and the apostles in the evening meal setting. And interestingly, the other apostles couldn't recognize him. They didn't even know when Jesus handed him the morsel, they still couldn't figure out what was going on. So can Satan infiltrate Jehovah's people? Don't be naive. The Corinthian congregation that Paul addressed them and sarcastically referred to their super fine apostles, apparently they had the stature of apostles and they dismissed Paul said that it, oh, his presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. They were like Greek orators, apparently, and the Corinthian brothers were in awe of them. They were the elders of the congregation. Paul said, they're phonies. They're agents of the devil. They're fake ministers of righteousness. He says, it's no wonder because Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Well, in a second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul warned his brothers, his anointed brothers, who would be on earth in the period immediately before the parousia and the manifestation of Christ. And he warned them not to be quickly shaken from their reason as regards a verbal message proclaiming that the presence is here, or a letter as though it comes from the apostles stating that the day of Jehovah is here. Paul said, do not believe it. Do not be quickly shaken from your reason. It, the parousia, it will not come until the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, gets revealed. Well, Paul went on to explain that this man of lawlessness would sit in the temple of the God and present himself as a God. The temple of God is, of course, the congregation of Christ, the spiritual temple. Paul explained it in numerous verses. He said, you are the temple of God. So this man of lawlessness presides over this temple of God by God's permission and he allows this operation of air and Satan promotes this man of lawlessness what did Paul say with every unrighteous deception 
all manner of trickery to make it seem as this man, this man of lawlessness is authentic. But it goes back to what Paul warned about. Do not be quickly shaken from your reason. <laughs> this is the message, really, of the Watchtower. Since its beginning, that the presence has begun and the day of Jehovah is here. The Watchtower used to say the presence, the parousia began in 1874. And then after 1914, some decade or more, then they, they kicked the presence back to 1914. And they said that was the beginning of the day of Jehovah too, up until about 1960. And then they, they've dropped that. And as I've described uh, in other videos, many of Jehovah's Witnesses have been shaken from their reason. But now at this stage, the apostasy has come. That Paul said the apostasy must come first. That is manifest in this, well, he said the mystery of this lawless, and this, this, is, this business with the library card and all that, that we're seeing the mystery of this lawlessness. And remember, this, this man of lawlessness is called the son of destruction. There's only one other reference in the Bible to son of destruction, as I mentioned, is Judas. And Judas was right there at the table with the apostles. So obviously the son of destruction in, in prophecy, this man of lawlessness in the temple, he will be among those who are God's called ones, the anointed, up until the manifestation of Christ destroys him. But all these deceptions, unrighteous deception and lying signs that Satan performs are for the purpose of convincing you that the parousia has begun and that the day of Jehovah is here. And that goes back to 1914. And it's, it's clear to me that those things were orchestrated because Satan knew that the uh, anointed congregation had reappeared, grouped around Russell. And so his intent was to establish a fake parousia that everyone would rally around preventing them from accepting the real one when it does occur. That's, and Jehovah allows that. That's the operation of error. Paul said he, Jehovah allows an operation of error to go to them that they may get to believing the lie in order that they may be judged because they did not accept the love of the truth. But you have to know the truth in order to love the truth. Christendom doesn't know the truth. They don't know the first thing about the truth. But Jehovah's Witnesses know the truth but they're under the influence of this operation of air. So when the Son of Man does arrive, and don't think we cannot see the sign of Christ's presence. I mean, I've, I've hammered on this thing till I'm crazy, but we're, we're on the edge of World War III. That's what's shaping up. You don't think there could be food shortages? Uh, there's a bunch of toxic radioactive dust blown in the air, the people's immune systems are compromised, you can get a global pandemic that will dwarf the Spanish influenza of 1919. Well, what about the preaching of Jehovah's Witnesses? Jesus said, and this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth and then the end will come. Surely that has been fulfilled. Well, it has to a certain extent. Recall though that when Jesus was on the earth, he trained 70 disciples along with the 12, and he sent them out. And he said, go preach the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. But when he sent them out, they didn't know what the kingdom of the heavens was. Even though Jesus referred to it as the kingdom of the heavens, they didn't know it was a heavenly kingdom. They still thought in earthly terms as the Jews did. They thought that the kingdom, the Messiah, was going to reestablish the Davidic kingdom and there in Jerusalem, literally in Jerusalem, and throw off the Roman yoke and all of that. They were under that impression even after Jesus died and was resurrected. They asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? So it wasn't until after Jesus ascended and Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, anointing them, opening up their minds more, 
then they got it. And that's when a new phase of their preaching began. And it was totally different. They, had, they were infused with a completely different spirit. Whereas before, you recall, when Jesus was arrested and Peter denied him, and even on the day of Pentecost, the 120 were in the upper room with the doors locked because they were afraid. But when the spirit came upon them, they were not afraid anymore. Peter was boldly standing in the temple, preaching about Jesus. And even after he was arrested and told to preach no more, we must obey God as ruler rather than men. They were fearless, and they filled Jerusalem with the teaching about Jesus. So in that, that can help us to appreciate the, the role that Jehovah's Witnesses have played up to this point, because Jehovah's Witnesses have preached the kingdom. But in a sense, they're, they're as the 70 were. They don't really know and appreciate what the kingdom really is. Imagining that Jesus has been ruling since 1914? Uh, no. But when the kingdom really does come, and then the, you know, the separation takes place, the angels remove the weeds, the wicked slave, they're gone, and the faithful are, will be infused with a new spirit. The watchtower won't be necessary anymore. But for those who make the transition, whose faith allows them to make the transition, they'll be infused with a new spirit. And that's what Jesus said, you will stand before kings and rulers. Don't worry about what you're going to say at the time. Holy Spirit will give you what you need at that moment. Now, when Jehovah's Witnesses go to court, they have a lawyer, don't they? Don't say this, don't say that. <laughs> that can't fulfill the prophecy. And so many other prophecies, uh, the Watchtower is interpreted to 1918, and it's just nonsensical. For example, the 11th chapter of Revelation, where Jesus comes down and he stands upon one foot on the sea and one on the land. And in other words, he's establishing himself as king. He's come down, has a rainbow over his head. And it says at that point, the sacred secret of God is finished. Was the sacred secret of God finished in 1918 or whenever? How could it have been? But anyway, at that, at that point, Jesus hands John a little scroll, tells him to eat it, and then he says, prophesy again to kings and nations. So there will be a great final work that the remnant the faithful of Jehovah's Witnesses will do. It will be different than the work they do now. We won't be standing around handing out pamphlets. I can pretty much guarantee you that. But it will give a final witness, and that will fulfill Jesus' words. The good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth, and then the end will come. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's where this apostasy has brought us to this point. And now, it's time for Jehovah to speak. <laughs>